We're going to keep looking into uh, the life of David, and and I want I I, I want to tell you, like, I really think that um, you know we kind of hit points in the story of the life of David that begin to kind of show us some stuff, and I I really think that what we hit uh, the po- point of the story where we hit today is is really. I don't know how to say it, and, I, and I'm really prayerful as we were worshiping. I was kind of praying, like, Lord, I, I really want to, I really want to communicate this well, because I think uh, we're kind of hitting the point in the story here that becomes uh, really, really critical, critical to the body, critical to um, to our own lives, critical us kind of stepping outside of a bondage. I think that the enemy puts on us oftentimes, and and it's a hard topic to talk about because it you have to there's a just trying to draw the precisely the right line. So I, I pray, I'm prayerful that we can kind of walk through this and really hit it um, like the Lord's speaking it, and and I'll do my best. And so we've been talking about it through the life of David. I think we are on sermon number. Anybody know? Uh, no, it hasn't been that long. Eighty-seven. We're on about number twelve or thirteen or so. I don't even know, uh, but we haven't gotten very far. We're we, we're still kind of in the first three or four chapters of his life, uh, and tonight we're going to look in chapter twenty-one. The last time we were seeing that uh, coming into chapter twenty-one, David is he's on the run now, and and uh, Saul is is after him, and we were seeing if I can kind of catch us up. We were seeing that. As he's on the run, you know, and the injustice he faced there with Saul, we're seeing that we kind of did a little thing there. We talked a little bit about how it was David found God in the face of injustice. And then we saw that he, how he discovered that religion was, was not enough, and it's really relationship that delivers. And, 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 and we were seeing that even as he's on the run, basically what he's doing is he is employing the things that he learned in Bethlehem, right? And so this time where he was... You know, nowadays, if we wanted to, uh, if they came to me and said, uh, you are to be the next king. What was that song? Steve, was it Steve Miller? Well, it's good to be king, Tom Petty. And have your own way, get a feeling of peace at the end of the day. You remember that one? Like, if they told me I'm going to be king, like, I want to be king, like, right away. Well, David uh, was what they after that he there was thirteen years in the time in between the time when he's king and he he just stays there in the uh in the pa- in the pastures in bethlehem and, and it's in that period of time where he's he's really learning all that he's going to need and so we're seeing him as he's on the run employing what it is the Lord taught him there in Bethlehem and so today David is still on the run but today it's kind of this is a real interesting point in the story I think because the the story kind of takes a turn we're in uh chapter twenty one and we'll pick it up there, and it says in verse 1 of chapter 21, Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech came trembling to meet him, and says to him, Why are you alone, and no one is with you? And so uh, here in the story, David comes to this place called Nob. It's not, I don't know, it's just it's a little northeast, I think, of Jerusalem. He comes to this place and to this priest, uh, this camp of priests, actually, uh, named, and the, the guy he's talking to is Elimelech. And here's what David says to him. The king has commissioned me with a matter. Uh, the king sent me, is what he's telling this priest. The king sent me. And he said to me, let no one know uh, anything about the matter on which I am sending you. So in other words, the king sent me. And in case you have any questions, let me tell you ahead of time that the king has told me not to answer any questions. And so uh, he says, uh, let no one know anything about the matter on which I am sending you and which I have commissioned you. And I have directed the young men to a certain place. So he comes to he comes to Nob. He's there in the presence of Ahimelech. And 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 Emily's like basically, what are you doing? And why are you alone? Um, it's implied there. Why are you alone? Because it's dangerous territory. And 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 he says, well, the king sent me. I'm here to do the king's bidding. Don't ask me any more questions. Is he telling the truth or is he lying? We just said we're in the story, and he's running from Saul. Saul's trying to kill him, and he comes to this priest and he says, well, the king sent me. Is he telling the truth or is he lying? He's lying. Uh, 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 he, he's, he's, he's lying. And, and, and so what we're going to see here as we, get, as, as we kind of move forward is that uh, we could call this truth or consequences because uh, there's going to be some substantial consequences to this lie. Let, let me kind of push forward in the story. 
So he comes to Nob, he talks to Elimelech, basically lies to him in, in, in verses 3 through 8. Basically he's lying to him to get what he wants. He needs to feed his men, he needs weapons, and he really actually even wants the priest's blessing there. And so he lies. Well, the, the, the priest then reacts out of that lie, and he does give them food. He gives them uh, the showbread, when you could stop right there and probably have a whole sermon, but I won't do that. And he also gives him uh, weapons. He gives him Goliath's sword. Right? And so David there lies. He protects his guys, um, but he does it with a lie. And what we're going to see is that this lie is not, uh, is not without consequence. And so we continue on then in verse 10. It says he arose that day. He leaves. He gets what he wants. He leaves. And, and, and he flees from Saul. Now look over in chapter 22. We're going to see what these consequences were. They were actually pretty significant. Uh, chapter 22, verse 9, it says, Then Dog, I think that's a, it's not like dog, like D-A-W-G. It's like Dog. Dog the Edomite who uh, was standing by the servants of Saul, answered and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob to Ahim Ahimelech, uh, uh, the son of, and I can't even pronounce that word, Ahitub, I think. And so he, he here's this guy, and he was there when David was telling these lies. He's there, and he knew that David was in that place, right? And so I'm thinking that Doug, he was kind of like, um, he was kind of like Saul's version of the NSA, if you think they're not listening, they're listening, right? So this is this is this him. Doug's there, and he he begins to say, and begins to kind of say he he was here, and he inquired verse ten of the Lord uh, for him, and he gave provisions, and he gave him a sword, the uh, the sword of Goliath the Phil Philistine, uh, and so then the king sends someone to summon Ahimelech the priest. He's going to find out whether or not this is true. We'll look in verse thirteen. Saul says to him, "Why have you and the son of Jesse conspired against me?" I'm sure the king's the the priest is thinking, Ooh, wait just a second. Like, dude lied, man. I the dude lied, and I I'm just just responding. He he told me, and but there's no real explanation offered. He says, "Why have you and the son of Jesse, David, conspired against me, in that you have given him bread and a sword, and you've inquired of the Lord for him, so that he can rise up against me by lying in ambush as it is this day?" And then look in uh, 16 verse 16. The king said, "You shall surely die." Ahimelech, you and all your father's household. Pretty significant consequence to this lie, right? And the king says to the guards who are attending him, turn around and put the priests of the Lord to death. Well, that's pretty severe because their hand is also with David and because they knew he was fleeing and they did not reveal it to me. So, bottom line, it's, it's David lies Ahimelech believes this lie. He responds and reacts to this lie because he believes it. And as a result, he and 85 of the priests are killed. Now, when we look at the thing, when I'm looking at a story like this, I'm thinking it's it's not even not quite that simple. I mean, it's complex. Doug has a role in that. He he he's the tattletale. I mean, Saul has a role in that. Saul was the one who ordered the killing. But David, with his lie, has some responsibility here, right? All right, we together on the story? Making sense? So uh, uh, just from the introduction, lesson number one might be that sin, sin has consequence. Like we live in a culture that um, maybe tries to deaden our, our spirit to that. But the truth is sin has consequence. And while it can obviously be forgiven and the penalty removed, still it often reaches way beyond where we think it will. True? True? I, I've, I've experienced that in my life. Maybe, maybe you have as well. And so all that's introductory. What I really want us to see is not so much the story, but I want us to see the psalm that David writes in response to all this. And I, when I see this, I'm going to tell you the initial blush of it. Like I find the psalm he writes about all this like shocking. It's over uh, Psalm 52 if you want to turn to it. This psalm, it says, was written when Dog the Edomite came and told Saul and said to him, David has come to the house of uh, Ahimelech. And so this is the psalm that David writes um, you know, uh, uh, about this whole, uh, whole event. Um, my question for you is this initially. Like, think about it. What if, what, if, what if you had told a lie and because of this lie you told, uh, um, you, you tell this lie, kind of save your own skin and maybe save your buddies and, and because of that, 85 people were killed. What would you say to the Lord? Right? I don't know. Um, you know you're guilty. 
maybe you don't bear all the responsibility, but you know you have a responsibility. And David knew that. He he said that in the course of the the narrative. And so you know you're guilty, and 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 you know that your lie, your sin, ha- the 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 consequence of that has been that that 85 people are slaughtered. Now, what you got to say to the Lord? I don't know if you've ever been there, man. I'm gonna tell you that that I have. Uh, without all the detail, I'll tell you I've been there. Have you ever just been in a place where you where you just screwed up royally? I'm not sure we're supposed to say it that way in church, but I think here we would all understand what I mean by that. Like you've been in this place where you, you just screwed up royally. I mean, so much like your heart feels like um, it, it just it feels like it's going to fall out of your chest or something. You know, you've been there. It's like, well, what's a conversation with God look like at that moment? Well, we're seeing... And I'm telling you, it's shocking because we're seeing right here in chapter 52, David's conversation with God uh, upon understanding and taking responsibility for his lie that kills 85 uh, priests. Um, let me give you first just kind of a brief outline of this. It's, it's shocking. I, but let me give you a, for a brief uh, kind of uh, outline. And, and then we'll kind of look at it in detail. Basically, Psalm 52, uh, verses 1 through 4, what David do, is doing here is he is describing dog's sin. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? Thy loving kindness of, the loving kindness of God endures all day long. And he's talking about dog, and he says, Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor, O worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, falsehood, falsehood more than, what is, than speaking what is right. Um, you love all words that devour, O oh, deceitful tongue. So he's talking about Doug. That's he's describing Doug's sin. That's that's as he's looking at this. He's not the only one with responsibility. Obviously, Doug had some responsibility as well. And then in verse five through seven, he is kind of pronouncing or describing what God's judgment on Doug is going to look like because of the sin that he enumerates there in verse one through four. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch you up and tear you away from your tent and uproot you from the land of the living. And the righteous will see and fear and will laugh at him, saying, Behold, the man who would not make God his refuge but trusted in the abundance of his riches and was strong in his evil desire. So he, he, he kind of, right, so now we're getting, first part, he's, he's, he's kind of enumerating Doug's sin. The second part, he's saying, here's what, uh, here, here's, here's God's judgment because of that sin. And now David begins to talk about himself. The, remember, this is the guy who lied, and because of his lie, 85 people are slaughtered. And here's what he says about himself. But as for me, I'm like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the loving kindness of God forever and ever, and I will give thee thanks forever because thou hast done, and I will wait on thy name for its good in the presence of thy godly ones. Now, when I first read that, I'm thinking, wait a minute, dude. Are you kidding me? You just lied and got 85 people slaughtered, and that's all you got? Think about what I was saying earlier. That time where you just screwed up royal, man, and there were consequences of that for that, not only for you, but for other people, and you screwed up royal, and your chest feels like it's going to, your heart feels like it's going to follow your chest, and you say, to Lord, you say to the Lord, ah, but Lord, as for me, I am a green olive tree in the house of God. Do you find that curious? I trust in the loving kindness of God forever and ever. I will give thanks forever i'll wait it's good to be in the presence of thy godly ones that's his that's his response to his sin now i i gotta think through that and think what 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 is what's going on here man what what's really happening in the story and here's my contention um and it's arguable but here here's my contention by the way of all by way of all that time that David spent in Bethlehem out in the pastures with God by the by the by way of all that those intimate times with God by David has learned to walk before God without shame ooh don't you think that's a big deal 
Like I, th- I think that's a big deal. Like I, I, I don't know how. I, I kind of grew up. Did who in here grew up hearing this phrase? Shame on you, buddy. I heard that one more often than I would like to remember. Sometimes from teachers, principals, my mom. Shame on you. Um, let me ask you a question. Where did shame begin? In the garden. When? After the fall. Uh, Beth Moore, who I think is one of the best, if you can get over the big hair and the Texas accent, I think she is one of the best teachers around these days. Beth Moore says, shame is the footprint of the enemy. Um, I'm not talking about godly so- I, These balances are really hard to, to walk. I'm not talking about godly sorrow. I'm talking about shame. She says, shame is the footprint of the enemy. And I think it's interesting. I, I was thinking about this. Like, we live in a culture that is shameless. And sometimes we gather in communities, the body, where we are riddled with shame. You find that curious? And so as I'm looking at the story, I'm trying to think, what, what really is the proper perspective here? And how is it that David could live so shame-free? Obviously, it's not because of his perfection. Like, the guy just lied and got 85 people killed. We know, even though we hadn't gotten there yet in the story, he's not a perfect guy. And so the question is, how is it that David could 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 live this shame-free life if, if it's not by way of his perfection because look like we know david lived in 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 this close intimate relationship with god right what well, you can't do that in the midst of shame like have you ever like you were kind of like you did somebody wrong man and every time you're around that person you're like just you kind of feel ashamed of it you know like you can't live in close, intimate relationship with someone when when you bear shame toward them. And so the question is, how does David live so shame free? Uh, uh, underneath that, you know, my thought is like, how can we live shame free? Because it's my contention that we are not supposed to or called to be living in the midst of shame. And it's also my contention that a whole bunch of us are. Um. I think that I I think and that's why I think this is such a critical juncture in the story. Like I I think that there are many in the body who are crippled with shame. Um I I I think they're they're crippled some of us are crippled even to the extent that it basically it renders us useless. And 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 we and and, and beyond all that it just it keeps us in this bondage. And so uh if it's not God's voice, all that shame, then let's look a little deeper and see if we can find some answers as to how it is. And we'll try to walk this out real carefully, but how it is, David, and, and how, how we can walk shame-free. Who would like to walk free of shame? Then you should be interested in the next part of the sermon. Because this is, here's, here's it. I, 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 I'm just pulling out about three things here, and it's not meant to be exhaustive. I really am trying to walk this balance of shame free not shame less but where, where does our shame free thing kind of really come from and how does that work and and so just bear with me and 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 um we'll see what we can get us the first thing i would say is we we uh how can we walk shame free first of all we can walk shame free by rejecting spiritual pride uh there and I, and, I, and i mean here i think there's there's two types of spiritual pride that we can kind of get caught up in the first one's kind of like dog his attitude basically is my my goodness is sufficient. You know, I, I, I if you read back through the narrative, read the story. Basically, his idea is, I'm good enough. Hey, uh, we might hear it voiced as, well, yeah, I messed up, but, like, look at those other guys. Well, or we, we might hear it as, you know, um, you know, stack it all up, and at the end of the day, I, I'll probably be all right. I'll probably be okay. And, and I, I, I knew a guy, and he was... Maybe not necessarily a great place, and he was an older guy, and he he said to me, "Well, <clears throat> said uh, you know, uh, me and me and Jesus, we kind of got our own thing worked out." Like really, you're that special? That's spiritual pride, right? 
The other form of spiritual pride is basically a pride that says, my sin is too big. And I think for us and for believers who are like really kind of legitimately trying to seek after, I think that's where we get caught sometimes, that, that says, my sin is too big. This, also, this is also pride because, in other words, I can do something that is so big that, God, you just don't have the power to forgive that. In other words, what I do is bigger than anything you can do. I would call that pride, right? And so I say here, uh, number one, we we can walk free of shame by rejecting spiritual pride. Um, in, in, in essence, not believing that our actions are, are more powerful or somehow above his. Um, and and uh, uh, this is basically what what David does. David says... Um, and as opposed to the spiritual pride thing, look at verse fifty-two, uh, chapter fifty-two, verse one. He says, "Why do you boast in evil? The loving kindness of God endures all day." All right, here's the quote for this one. You're probably going to want to write this down. It's really good. I worked on it hard. The goodness of God is the initial confession of shame-free living. Does that make sense? It may not totally make sense right now. Maybe after we get to the next couple, it'll, it'll make sense. But just kind of note that the goodness of God is the initial confession of shame-free living. It really starts there. Well, how do we live shame-free? Uh, obviously not bound up in spiritual pride. That keeps me from uh, understanding really who I am and, and who he is. How do we live shame-free? Uh, how about this one? By the rejection of self-reliance. In contrast to David, it is said of Dog in verse 7, there in chapter 52. Uh, this man, look at the end of that. He says, he trusted in the abundance of his riches and was strong in his evil desire. His trust was in his riches. Have you ever had this conversation with the Lord? Uh, he, he he in other words this guy is self-reliant my presupposition is that we can be too in a little bit different way have you ever had this this conversation with the lord oh god can you believe i did that and the lord's response is yeah yeah i, I can i can believe that no no really like i did this grievous thing again can you believe it and the lord's response is yeah I got no problem believing that. Look, part of spiritual maturity is this journey of self-discovery where we really understand what we're capable of. And when we understand what we're capable of, I'm telling you, like Doug, there is no room for self-reliance. Shame-free living uh, uh, does not include self-reliance, right? Um he here's the deal as i try to encapsulate this and i hope i'm communicating this well here's your, here's the quote on this one he wants you to trust in his dedication to you not your dedication to him does that make sense like if i am trusting in my dedication to him that's self-reliance lord i swear i will never do that again oh really See, like, if I'm trusting in my dedication to Him, I, I, I'm, 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 I, I, got, I ain't got anything. What David is doing in the Psalm is he's trusting in the Lord's dedication to Him. Does that make sense? So we start with this premise, the initial confession of the goodness of God, and understanding that out of His goodness, His dedication to us is what sustains us. Is this making sense? And so. Um, I, I, I had the thought that, that maturity is likely evidence when our commitments flow out of gratitude, right? It's not, okay, I'm going to straighten up and be a good boy. But in gratitude, when I understand that he loves me more than I can imagine, and I come to the table with really nothing to offer, let, let, let our commitments flow out of that. Our commitments flow out of his commitment to us. Is that making sense? Well, let me try. Let me try to throw one more at you, 
and and then we'll see what maybe what the Lord wants to do with that. Finally, how is it we live shame free? How did David? I'll give you this quote up front. How about this one? By having confidence in an embrace that is outrageous in its kindness. Uh, look at uh, 50, chapter 52, verses 8 and 9. But as for me, now think of what David just did. And think about the confidence he must have in the goodness of God and the outrageous nature of his embrace to say, but as for me, I'm like a green olive tree in the house of the Lord. I trust in the loving kindness of God forever and ever. See, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a little easier if I kind of get into this mode where, you know, right now I, I'm doing pretty good. Feeling pretty good about myself. Well, you know, I don't know that the Lord's really got all that much ammunition to be mad at me anyway. So I, I can kind of trust in his loving goodness, his loving kindness. Like David's coming out of this whole different position where where he, he doesn't have room for that. He's like, I trust in the loving kindness of God forever and ever. Whether uh, he is trusting in this outrageous embrace of God's kindness that is so outrageous that he embraces us whether we deserve it or not. I think I'm not the only one. I think that uh, not, a, not a lot of us really trust his embrace. And because we don't trust his embrace, we can't go to him to get the healing that we need, which means we continue to walk in shame. Is that making sense? Um, there was a there was a girl. I we I'm sure that next week the guys from Floyd Fest will come back and give uh, you know more detailed reports. But like there was just but for me I one my most significant conversation probably was with a, a girl who was I think she was 21, 22. She said she was from Northern Virginia. She looked kind of ethnic, so I asked her, um, "Where are you from?" And she said, "I'm uh, I'm half Afghanistan." I'm like, oh, I never heard of that country. I've traveled a lot, but I never heard of Afghan. She said, well, I, my father is Afghan, and my mother is from Georgia. I'm like, oh, just like south of uh, Russia. She's like, no, Georgia, the peach state. So she said, and she was, she was going to explain all that. And so we just kind of got to talking, and, and um, she started talking about her father. And I asked her, is there, you know, she came to the prayer tent. So I asked her, is there something we can pray, pray for you about? And she said, yeah, I really want... Um, what I want is unity with my dad. And I was like, oh, wow. And and so I was like, oh, okay, well, uh, we can pray for that. And uh, tell me tell me kind of what's going on. She said, well, my dad was, um, when I was 14, my dad went to work for the U.S. government in Afghanistan. I guess he was Afghan and knew the culture and knew the language and maybe even knew some special people in Afghanistan. And so he went to work for the U.S. government to help feed the government information. Well, in the course of this, now some eight years later, outside of a couple of texts and maybe an email or two, she's had no conversation with her father at all. And on one hand, she's kind of scared of her father. And on one hand, she really uh, wants to reunite with her father. But on the other hand, she's like really mad at him too, right? Because she just kind of took off and left everybody. And... And so we prayed, and that was all really cool. And just prayed that there would be uh, that she would have wisdom, and prayed that it's just simple stuff, you know, like Sunday school, Nashville, man. Like we're just praying like that she would have wisdom, and that she would have um, some discernment. And we're praying for unity because Jesus, He's all about unity. And so we're just kind of praying, and that was good. And and she was receiving that. And that the Lord just kind of spoke to me, and right as she was leaving, I said, Hey, can I say just say one thing? What you have seen in your father is not reflective of your heavenly father. And she said, "What?" And she's Muslim, right? And she said, "I said, she said, what? I said, what you have seen reflected in your father, and I don't know, maybe even what you've been told at the mosque, is not reflective, really, of who your heavenly father is and how much he loves you." And like she broke down and just sobbed. 
hey guys, it's it's not just lost Muslims. I think in and in, in, around us on Sundays, oftentimes there are many of us who don't have confidence in an embrace that is outrageous in its kindness. And apart from it, there's no way I can I, 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 I can I can really walk shame free. The reason that Psalm 52 is so shocking to me, this conversation David has with God just after he learns that his sin kills and slaughters 85 people, the reason that's so shocking to me is I don't really understand who he is. And, and I don't really understand this embrace that, 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 that I, can, I can run to in order that I can be uh, 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 free of that shame. So, lessons from the life of David. What differentiates him uh, from from Saul, and what differentiates him from Doeg, is uh, he. At least one thing is he's not caught, he's not held, he's not in bondage to shame. Right. And my sense is, I'm going to get Will, if you, you'd come up and play, maybe play something quieter. And, um, because my, my sense is that, that um, it's not impossible that, that we can, even as believers, we can really be caught in a pattern of self-sufficiency. Or we can uh, be not trusting of his embrace. Um, or we can be suffering under the notion that our sin is too big for him to handle somehow. Or we can get caught in trying to, in a cycle of really, because we can't run into that embrace, trying to make our atonement, some religious atonement for ourselves. And what I want us to do tonight is like, like when I go to Floyd Fest, you know what I see? I see shamelessness. You know what else I see? Sometimes I see more freedom than I see on Sunday afternoon. And like the truth is, the truth is, we, 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 because of this relationship with God, because of that embrace of his, because of the work he's done, like we can come to him and we can walk shamelessly from the right perspective. <laughs> We can we can be without shame and free, uh, maybe even more than all the hippies at Floyd Fest. I don't know. And so, really, what I want us to do is, I, I just want us to, um, I, I really just want us to, I, I, I want to encourage you. Like, I just want to encourage you, like, be free. And there is a a father with a loving embrace to 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 welcome you in and to. And to, and to allow you to walk without shame. And I don't know, maybe that's something you need to kind of pray through and pray about, and that's cool. Um, we're, I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to sing.